get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, now Roger Sharp, and many more and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Roger Sharp, who's one of the most idolized people in pinball history. He's the Babe Ruth of pinball when he called his shot in 1976 to help legalize pinball. Roger was considered one of the top players in the world and now his sons are among the top in the world also he has worked in game licensing and marketing for over 35 years roger thanks for joining me it is my pleasure thank you you. so i know we're having some bandwidth issues and i want to give a special thanks to steve rosen for helping make this happen and he is also one of the best three-point shooters i've played basketball with (laughs) and so I'm really excited to get into this, and since we're having bandwidth issues, I just wanted the video to show up in the beginning, and now we're going to go to the the landline so we make sure all your big lessons uh, come through. All right. did, did you want to stay with this for a while until it craps out, or it's up to you? Sure. We could stay with this. Um, you know, one thing I wanted to talk about first is, you know, I watched a lot of videos for you, and then the Vice video you told me about. Um, about some history of pinball, you and your sons. What was so emotional for you about that documentary? I think you know, talking about the choice of language that uh, one of my sons tends to use while he's playing pinball, which is always a nice reflection on his upbringing. Um, I, I think, in all seriousness, it was the fact that you know the life that we live. At least this is my view: the life that we live as as parents. You'd like to think that the children that you raise have some uh, degree of, of uh, respect and admiration for, for who you are and what you're about and yeah. hopefully the life lessons that you teach them. Yeah. And I think that that was why. I, I think it was just it was just an emotional time of, you know, my feeling that, and again, my, my life, specifically pinball and, and so on, uh, that, uh, yeah, you know, I haven't embarrassed them too much. Um, I think you've seen some of the videos in the way that I tend to play. It's a little bit more theatrical, a little bit more physical than a lot of other people. Not saying that it's the right or the wrong way. There's reasons behind why that is. The why way is that? It is. Why is it? Because um, I did notice it, that you have like a staggered stance. And oh yeah, yeah. No, I mean, yeah. a lot of it is uh, predicated on the fact that I have two ruptured discs in my back. Oh wow. So, you know, when you're playing pinball, I mean, if you're playing competitively or, or whatever else, the ability to kind of, you know, stand um, takes a toll on my back. So I wind up just doing things to kind of alleviate mm. any of the stress or pressure that I have. You know, yeah. Steve Rosen, uh, aforementioned, uh, we've had a chance to play golf from time to time. And uh, I know that some people, when they see me tee off, if they raise my leg, they know that I've gotten a good shot because, again, it's just kind of releasing some of the uh the stress and and whatever uh, pressure that i'm putting on but yeah. again going back to the original question um i think it's really just uh wanting them to have an appreciation for mm-hmm. for who i am yeah. out in the real world so yeah so it was emotional yeah and there were some other things that were kind of going on during the course of that weekend as well so it, I, I think that it just all caught up with me um, yeah so yeah, his he was wearing a shirt that said "My Dad Saved Pinball." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Friends of theirs have uh, done some uh, fun stuff in the past. So when did they start beating you? Um, well, I mean, let's 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 put that in proper perspective. <laughs> yes, um, <laughs> they they do tend to win more often than not. There not always. Okay. There are occasions where uh, I, I blindfolded them. No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> You know, I would think probably over the last 10 to 15 years or so, mm-hmm. maybe longer, uh, when they got seriously into playing competitive pinball, um, they were not really allowed to play pinball growing up. I mean, we have pinball machines. They weren't. Uh, why not? Some of the games, yes. Some of the games, no. Um, 
I didn't want them getting caught up in the games. I mean, I, I had a very, very specific way of wanting to, to parent. And yeah. it didn't include, you know, playing pinball. I've gotten asked over the years just because of the skill level uh, by some people, uh, majority of them being women, just saying, so um, when they came home from school, did they have a set time to do homework and then practice pinball? It's like, no, God, no. I mean, I, it was part of their lives, obviously, yeah. but it wasn't something where it was like, go and play. If anything, I think that the beauty of it was that they kind of took it for granted. So when their friends came over, they loved who, it. who yeah. you know, my sons were ready to play on any of the game systems we might have had, right. they were automatically going to the pinball machines. Mm. Um, so, again, um, I think that probably within... Uh, you know, the past 15, 20 years where they have really kind of achieved uh, a higher level of, of game playing and game analysis. I've, I've always looked at competitive pinball as being uh, uh, comparable to chess, where you're looking at the, the beginning of the game, mid-game, and it's really the end game. It's a question of, you know, how do you control that board, if you will, yeah. with whatever pieces you've sacrificed and wherever that, that power may be in terms of how you move forward to, to hopefully achieve a checkmate against your opponent. The same thing, really, if you wind up analyzing pinball. And each game is different, and each game plays differently, but there are certain objectives, and it's a question of really determining what's your best way to go. And my son tends to joke that, uh, you know, oh, yeah, our dad will make a, a ramp shot over and over again just because he likes it, not because it's worth points. <laughs> so, so I think it's, it's that kind of stylized difference. In approach, so who tends to win the most out of the three of you? You and the two sons. Oh, uh, either Josh or Zach, most definitely. Me, no, uh, hardly ever. Um, I think if we're playing older style games, where some of the nuances and subtleties of, of how you play a game and how you trap a ball and control, because you're more experienced um, at those. I am, and and I think that you know it's it's interesting. I, I tend to also use golf analogies because. Uh, the old-time golfers from Sneed and Hogan and whatever else played with real woods. They didn't play with the new technology. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, a long drive was 200 yards. Now it's like, you know, 200 yards, that's, I don't know, that's a, that's a seven iron. That's an eight iron. <laughs> um, that and technology I think that, has changed. Well, I'm sure of the course layouts and what they've done, forgetting about traps, water, trees, and whatever else, we're just talking about the sheer length. You wind up hearing, well, this golfer is going to have some trouble because he's not a long hitter. So he's going to have to be accurate. It's going to take him three shots for the par five, where some of the other guys, it may be two shots. So you wind up starting from that deficit, and I think it becomes you know, problematic as to you know, what level of success that you can have. And for my sons, they've played on older games and newer games, but again, the style and methodology of gameplay without getting into the intricacies of it, because I think it's probably for people who don't play pinball incredibly boring, um, I, I think that what they've been able to attain and achieve is really, really remarkable. And then between the two of them, it's just a question of who's on that particular time. The, the majority of tournaments that take place, there's over 2,000, and that number is growing worldwide. Every year? Of the number of events, yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, it's, it's astounding. If you go to the IFPA website, yeah. IFPA Pinball, uh, you'll get a sense of things as to what we've been able to achieve and accomplish. But within that context... Most of those competitions are marathons. I mean, you're starting on a Friday and you're playing, you know, really? all day Friday into the wee hours of the morning. And yeah, how many hours early? How many hours will one player play for? Like, a, let's say they get to the finals. How long? How many hours of pinball will they have played? Probably about fifty or sixty hours in a two and a half day stretch. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's literally almost your every waking hour. So you're starting at maybe eight o'clock in the morning and playing until two in the morning. And then you're getting up to play at 8 o'clock in the morning until maybe midnight or, or 1. And then you're getting up again at 8 o'clock in the morning and playing through. I know that for both of my boys, yeah. if there are events that are taking place where they have flights, I know that they have uh, on occasion missed those even the same. So how do you train for that? I mean, you're standing up for three days straight. And, and I think I watched one of the documentaries – one of your sons, I don't remember which one, says he sweats profusely through the whole the whole time. How do you train? Do they train for this or just play? I, I play, but I think really it's a question of analyzing what are the games that are going to be played. 
<clears throat> do they tell you ahead of time or do you sometimes yes sometimes you do know all right here's a lineup of games other times you're going in totally cold yeah and it's a question of what the structure of the the tournament is if you can find some time to sit back if you can find some time to maybe grab a bite to eat and i tend yeah. not to eat while i'm playing in tournaments uh, i drink a lot of tea if i can or or whatever else and you've done some amazing things as well in the licensing world for the pinball yeah. machines can you talk about what's been one of the most successful or proudest licensing deals that you were able to put together uh there's been any number of them obviously and, and for those who aren't aware um yeah i mean licensing was something that occurred at least in the world of coin operated amusement games back in the mid to late 70s it actually put valley pinball on the map um had a, a tremendous impact um you know when the industry kind of went dormant for a while when video games took over in uh, the late 70s very early 80s and companies like d gottlieb uh, williams electronics valley chicago coin and and, and back then uh, stern electronics we're kind of taking it hard. Who are they competing against? Like Atari, or who is who is? Well, yeah, it? Atari was out there. Atari actually started doing pinball. Oh, really? Uh, recently, Sega, Namco, uh, Nintendo. I mean, you had this confluence of everybody saying, hey, "We have mall game rooms, Aladdin's castles, and like that existed back then. Uh, they needed to be populated with machines." So uh, pinball kind of fell to the background because of this new phenomenon called video games where you were actually interacting with ostensibly a TV, a TV screen. Right. Whether it was vector or raster graphics to play Space Invaders or Pac-Man or other games for that era, there was a fascination of people wanting to have that kind of experience where pinball was, again, kind of intimidating, a little bit off-putting, and a little bit to pay some tribute to an old Ozobiel campaign. Uh, this is your grandfather's pinball. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we want new technology, even though the technology of pinball back then was new. It was electromechanical before it had gone to solid state. So, again, um, what wound up emerging uh, was uh, a new breed of uh, pinball machines in new locations. Um, and uh, when I came on board, uh, in 1988 and made the move from the East Coast back home, if you will. Uh, I believed in brand licensing. Right. And suggested it, uh, much to the uh, chagrin and uh, the negative reaction from uh, the corporate executives at Williams uh, because we were about to uh, purchase, in fact, we did, the amusement game division from Valley at Valley Midway. And as was told to me, look where it got them. I was like, well, that, but that was before. And I, I think that there's room for it. So Elvira was the first brand license that I worked on, and working with Cassandra was just a real treat. Yeah. Uh, the game was a remarkable success. Uh, the introduction of it at a trade show was something that was beyond my imagination. What, did it, what was it like? Oh, God, the seas parted. Uh, the, the trade show took place actually at uh, what was then the uh, Hilton. It's now the Westgate, but it's attached to the convention center in Las Vegas in their convention area. And uh, we had two games uh, set up, one for Williams and one for Bally. One was Police Force. The other was Bally. had kind of outfitted the booth into this kind of regal place for uh, Cassandra to sit. So she uh, was there, like... She was there in person. De debuting and, with the... And we, uh, we had an entourage bring her in. And uh, because Police Force was the Williams game, uh, I had outfitted uh, the crew, myself included, into, like, police guard. So, and we had actual real, you know, police-type people as well. But here we are all of us, uh, mm. bring her in, and I wanted to make certain, because back then it was a very large, it was much larger than the show has become, um, I wanted to make sure that we went down every darn aisle <laughs> until we got to our booth. Right. That's great. This conga line comes in, the season. I mean, part. she's, oh my God, I mean, that, she that picture on the pinball machine, 
I'm is, sorry? I mean, the picture of her on the pinball machine is um, probably a good sight for a pinball player to be uh, looking for at. For almost anybody, yes. Right. I, mean, I yeah. forget. It could have been Hulk Hogan who was there. It didn't matter. I mean, it was like all eyes and everybody's kind of moving. And we get to the booth. There was a line, probably like a line waiting outside an Apple store for the latest and greatest mm-hmm, mm-hmm. before. Yeah. Um, and I, I remember and, and getting her to, to sit on, you know, in, in her throne that we had set up with spider webs and all sorts of other stuff to, to sign autographs. We had pictures, you know, done for a sign. I remember going up to the the first person in line, this is a trade show, this is a business show. These are location owners and operators and distributor salespeople who are looking at the latest and greatest technologies, the latest and greatest games and attractions right. to make purchase decisions for their livelihood. Right. This is not an insignificant time to just kind of kick back because it's finite time for the three-day show. Right. And I remember going up to the first guy and they just said, how, how long have you been waiting here? Uh, three and a half hours. Whoa. Whoa. Oh, okay. Okay, great. I knew I had a hit. I knew that it was uh, beyond belief. Cassandra was marvelous uh, to uh, really kind of uh, be there for, for everybody in line, uh, to sign autographs and just be, you know, this fantastic person for us. Um, so that was a cherished memory of my first license being the success that it That's was. That's amazing. So that was your first license. Yeah. Wow. Uh, the first one on the video game side was wow. uh, NBA Jam. I There's a video of you on YouTube of playing NBA Jam. Oh, you, you of know the that? Actual, playing of it? Of the or? actual game. Yeah. Of the actual oh, of video me being game. one of the hidden yes, characters. Exactly. Yes, I am. Yes. I am in that and also NFL Blitz. <laughs> so, uh, so, yes. So, NBA Jam only because uh, no professional sports league had ever done a license for a coin-operated amusement game. Mm-hmm. So I had to start from scratch to, to get the NBA to agree. How did that work? How did you do that? It was about a year and a half and just kind of uh, giving them, and again, I come from a position of some credibility based on, you know, whatever my, I don't know, whatever my reputation can you just send them the link to Drunk History and then they'll <laughs> do a deal with you? Yeah, really, back then, that <laughs> no. would have been good. No, but for the NBA, it was like there's this great opportunity and this is who we are as a company and yeah. this is who we are reaching out there. Um, and uh, so I think those those two, just because they were first and yeah. proved to be as successful, uh, subsequent to that, uh, the Monopoly license for slot machines, uh, for WMS Gaming, uh, that took me seven years to close. Wow, seven years? Yep, but I tend to be somewhat persistent <laughs> in, in, in believing in something that's right. Right, right and trying to make sure that any antiquated views, any stigma attached to allowing imagery to be on a pinball machine or a video game or a slot machine, uh, I just want the decisions good, better, and differently to be made for the right reasons. Yeah. And not because the thought is, oh, my God, this is terrible. This is taking, you know, lunch money from children. Uh, this is uh, taking uh, benefits from uh, the elderly. You know, the, the see. world changes. And as it changes, uh, you know, you try to be there to provide, you know, wisdom and guidance and hopefully build trust. Right. So that Wizard of Oz, uh, I take a lot of pride in being able to achieve that. And, you know, there are any number of, you know, other stories, other projects that uh, I take uh, an incredible amount of satisfaction in being able to to make them all happen. What I mean, took so long with the monopoly? Why do you why do you think it took? Oh, well, because there had not been licensing. I started in '91 talking to them. Mm-hmm. There was no licensed content in the world of slot machines back then. Mm, wow. We were not a slot machine company necessarily. We were still a pinball video game company. We were moving toward becoming a slot machine company. Yeah. But, you know, this is pre-Wheel of Fortune. Yeah. Uh, um, so starting from scratch, uh, getting the belief of the company executives that, you know, it's working in coin op. So if we're going to, you know, do something. And I had started conversations with Hasbro to uh, 
do a Monopoly themed pinball machine. So the segue into the other. And it was just a question of comfort level. It was a question of believing yeah. enough with uh, Alan Hassenfeld and his other lieutenants that uh, this is the right choice with their crown jewel and carving out an original agreement that would allow both sides to walk away if, God forbid, there was any backlash. Right. That there was anything negative attached to it. Right. And that takes time. I mean, it took me four years for Wizard of Oz Mm. as a machine. It took me... Uh, we go back to NBA Jam. Yeah. Uh, it took me a year and a half just telling Sal and Mark, Sal DeVita and Mark Jamel, keep going. Uh, trust me, we'll be able to, I'm going to get this license for you. Don't stop. Don't stop. Just keep going and I will make this happen. Mm. Just being devoted and dedicated to, uh, you know, to, to what the challenges are. What pushed him over the edge after seven years finally? To actually do it. <laughs> Probably just saying, all right, Roger, you're bored. <laughs> Leave me alone. Enough's enough. Just do it. But I, I have a certain work ethic. Yeah. And I think that work ethic is just, you know, predicated on how I was raised, the time frame. And it's something that I fervently believe in. That You, you don't do it for ego. Right. Uh, you do it because you believe in it. And, right. You know, I've always had, I guess... Maybe unfortunately or fortunately, I've always had a perverse sense of loyalty to the companies, agencies, magazines, whatever that I've worked with. Yeah. Where I'm doing it because it's the right thing to do. Right. I'm doing it because it needs to be done, and I believe in it. And I believe in it with my heart and my soul. And uh, I'm going to make this happen. So it's a, it becomes a challenge. But I think that, you know, anything in life... Um, if it's worth it, then you pay the price to make it worth it. And, uh, you know, I've worked on uh, a few hundred licensed projects over the years. Um, you know, my first show was back in 87, so I've been at this for almost 30 years. Yeah. Uh, the relationships that I've built, the reputation that I have, I, I take great humility and pride in because people know that when they are working with me on anything, Right. They're going to get my heart, my soul, my energy, my passion, um, and I'm never going to let them down. I want to go On back to the side, whether it's licensee, licensor, yeah. or whatever else. I, I was going. I want to go back to the first one because people could the viral one because people could say, "Well, Roger, you're Roger Sharp. You know, you have a track record." So you going to NBA Jam or Monopoly or Wizard of Oz? Those those weren't really track records back then. That was me just you know yeah. attempting to justify number one, Williams Bally Midway as a partner. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, gathering some credibility that you no know, pinball's on its way back. I mean, I used to get you know joked about by uh, you know the the president of the company because they'd see a feature in the New York Times front page quoting Roger Sharp that, you know, the business is doing $5 billion a year. Where do you get these numbers from, Roger? What? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, they just, they printed it. If it's in New York Times, it must be true, Neil. Right? So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was, I was this, you know, publicity person on behalf of the company. And since the notables of the company didn't want to be interviewed, I was like, you just talk to them, Roger. Mm-hmm. Really? Why? No, go. You just do it. So you take that lead, and you run with it, and you build stories. Look, I, I, I was a director of marketing, and effectively what became the director of licensing, that position didn't exist when I got there. But heading up marketing, I was doing trade shows. I was working with the ad agency. I was doing promotions. I was doing everything. And I was working as the intermediary, if you will, between corporate management who may or may not have had a particular insight into what made a successful game, and the designers in the back who hopefully kind of respected my my word, my view, so I could go back to corporate management to say, hey, thumbs up, this game is looking good. I only say that because... So with, so yeah. with Monopoly and Elvira and whatever else, it was just a question of uh, identifying 
something that made sense and going after it yeah. and trying to provide, and again, I go back to what we discussed earlier, trying to be as referential as possible. You know, there's, there's articles and there's proof, I and mean, whether it's my book or not, whether it's the fact that at one point in time I was the editor of Video Games Magazine, and you know I could reference that and have familiarity with that stuff, it was a question of really setting up and identifying what the opportunity was and who the partner could be with them that would pay tribute to them, that would do everything right with them, that would go through the appropriate steps and stages for approvals so that they had a hand in it every step of the way. So you make whatever the compelling sales pitch is and hope that you cover all bases. And more importantly, and I think it's true again with everything, you listen to the questions yeah. and answer the questions. You answer the concerns. And, you know, again, if you build up that reputation over a period of time and years and deals, people know the authenticity, at least by which I do my work. Yeah, I will ask about the first one, too, because some, I mean, probably a lot of people, licensing sounds great, you know, but they have no idea the, the mechanics behind actually setting up a licensing deal. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, everybody sees the, the end product and says, oh, God, it's so exciting. Did you get to meet with Arnold Schwarzenegger on Terminator? Yes. Oh, oh, oh. And, and you met with Cassandra? Oh, oh, oh. I mean, yeah, I mean, all of that is all that's, that's icing on the cake. And Gordie Howe when we did hockey. I mean, the list kind of goes on and on. Right. And, on, on. and, and, and I don't uh, uh, lessen the, the value of that, but that's not why you do it. Right. Um, and, and there is an art to the deal if you will. And everybody tends to think, look, all I gotta do is throw money at whoever the that targeted brand is, whether right. it's a personality, corporate identity, whatever else. Just throw enough money at them we can do the deal. Well, no. No, yeah. no, no. It has to be much more personalized. And uh, you know, yeah. I, I, I give a lot of credit to uh, my stepfather who had clothing stores. One of them was in Evanston called Seelig's way back when. Uh -huh. And his personal style helped define my, I guess, my ultimate personal style. So, yeah, I mean, it's hands-on, it's touchy-feely. That's just me. I mean, so yeah. the Elvira first one, were there other options? Or oh, yeah, you... absolutely. Uh, one of the ones I wanted to do, which went back to 87 before I worked for the company, was going to my first licensing show that was in New York City. And yes, there are conventions for this. Yeah. Um, and seeing three different properties that I thought were kind of interesting. Of, uh, a couple of them, well, I guess all of them were upcoming movies or, or what have you. Probably a year, year and a half out. Uh, one was uh, Willow. Yeah, I saw that, yeah. And it was like, you know, I don't know. I'm seeing some of these clips. I think this is a little bit too hard edge. I don't think it's going to be the fantasy kind of end of all. The other was Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Sure. And I figured that Disney would probably be difficult to work with. Plus, I just don't know. It looks a little bit too sexy. Um, and the third was from a couple of guys who had a black and white comic book that was now being represented for the first time, and there were great plans for it. It was called, the guys were Eastman and Laird, and it was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yeah. And I said, God, this is crazy and weird and wonderful. Ha! Huh. And I remember making the pitch at uh, Williams to uh, have them consider Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Right. Which I said, this is going to hit. This is going to be big. Trust me. Believe me. Yeah, I know. And then, and I forgot. You have a uh, tough job with this. You have to predict somewhat the future. You have to yeah. pitch your company, and then you have to go pitch the other company to do a deal with your company. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. And, and you want to make certain that at least internally, now with the clients that I'm working with and representing, or for the decades that I was at Williams Valley Midway WMS Gaming, that there really is a desire to want something and not just to fill in 
no pun intended, for the slot machine, not to fill in a slot. Right. That, that the designers um, are really into Monopoly, are really into Iron Man, are into Willy Wonka. I mean, the list goes on and on. Terminator, uh, Adam's Family, Twilight Zone, NBA Jam, NFL Blitz, uh, NHL Open Ice. I mean, again, on and on and on and on. That, uh, you know, what I am, in quotes, pursuing is something that everybody has uh, a specific interest uh, in wanting to bring to life. What happened with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Uh, they went elsewhere. Hmm. Uh, Diddy East wound up doing a pinball, which was okay for them. Uh, Konami did a series of video games back in the day of the original Nintendo uh, system. Uh, that were very very successful and yep we didn't we didn't go there. So was so, that, I mean a missed yeah. opportunity, but it was okay. It wasn't meant to be. What did the for the Elvira one since they that was their first one? What did they want? What did your company want? Well, I mean it, it was interesting. And it, again, I mean I don't remember specifically how yeah. I might have. I think I might have encountered. One of her managers back then at a trade at the licensing show, and then we kind of reached back mm. out. Cassandra was really into pinball. And really? When, yeah. Oh. Wouldn't it be neat to do a pinball machine and Bally, obviously. Let's face it, the song from Tommy, who doesn't want to be a pinball wizard. Uh, the the prehistory uh, back in the late seventies with Elton John, you know, Captain Fantastic, Wizard. Uh, Dolly Parton, Holland Love Trotters, Rolling Stone, I mean, the list goes on and on from that era yeah. uh, brand licensing for the company. Uh, and we got to talking, and it was just like, wow, really? Let me see what I can do. Right. I think this would be wonderful. Right. And we're going internally to the various design teams and just designers. Hi, I think I can get us Elvira. Who wants it? I think it should be a ballet game because it is Elvira. And Williams has never really kind of, in quotes, stood out mm -hmm. in the same fashion, if you will. Right. Use that as a uh, <clears throat> reference. Uh, Bally was known for having very beautiful, glamorous, over endowed women. Right. Part of the artwork over the years. So I just said, it, this is Bally game. And uh, right. Dennis Nordman and Greg Ferris uh, stood up and said, yes, we'd love to do it if you can get it for us. And kind of, you know, went about the way of negotiating, and you know, all the majority of licensing deals tend to embrace financials, whether they're guarantees, royalties. Yeah, how does that? Do they get a royal? Tend to get a royalty off of each one sold, or how does that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a simple answer. Uh, if it's something where there's shared revenue, then sometimes it's shared revenue. That's part of that financial equation sometimes and in the case of Cassandra uh, there were also games involved along with financial remuneration because she was a fan of pinball wanted her own games so yeah mm. so it was a combination yeah and and it was it was great I mean uh, I will share just an aside during the process because we're on the phone talking and kind of going through and yes I work closely in generating contracts and deal memos and so on so it is multi-purpose in terms of the role that I've taken on right um, you know and again I'm not trying to jump back and forth but there's a a linkage to it yeah when I was offered the job of associate editor um, my comment back to the managing editor and editor of GQ was I know nothing about magazines <laughs> you know how to type you know how to write okay and we wound up structuring things accordingly, but there was there was no uh, handbook, if you will. When Condé Nast purchased GQ, and at that time I was the managing editor, and Condé Nast with Vogue and Mademoiselle and, and so on, uh, they called in the, the chief editors as a fashion director, it was the editor-in-chief, and myself, to, I guess, sit down, a meet and greet with, an executive vice president of all of Kanye Nast. And I remember sitting down across from uh, this guy 
that is it. All right. So before we get started, let me tell you what I do as a managing editor, and you can tell me if if it's what a managing editor does. Right. Because I don't know. Right. It's, and I start with this litany of stuff. And it's like, oh my God, no! I have eight people involved to do that. I have six people over here at, at Glamour to do that. I, huh? You're doing this? This? No, 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 no. You. I mean, I I was far out stripping what a typical manager. Right in quotes, should do, but it was like, again, there was no handbook. So with licensing, if you will, there was no handbook for it. I became, I used to joke, uh, and still do, that I'm there from preconception to grave. Right. And that midpoint in between, however long or short it takes, think of me as a creative liaison to make things happen as effectively and efficiently as I possibly can. So if I can babysit throughout that process, that's what I do, so I keep my hands in it. And I can be protective of the people on this side, as well as looking out for the best interests of the people on the other side. Yeah. So in terms of Elvira, I forget, we were, I don't know if we were discussing a potential photo shoot, which we wound up doing. We sent a game out with a few of us to California, working with a photographer and so on, to do a photo shoot for effectively what was the pinball flyer that I was writing. Uh, not even a discussion about the trade show appearance and how we were going to navigate that with her hair and makeup people and so on and so forth. But I'm on the phone with uh, one of her managers is actually someone who became her husband. Um, hmm. And I just remember this. <clears throat> so we're having this conversation, and I hesitate for a minute. I said, oh, wait, one other thing. And I'm trying to remember what I want to ask. And just out of the blue... Mark Pearson was his name. Mark said, yep, they're real. And it's like, huh? <laughs> uh, thank you very much. It was not what I was going to ask, but thank you. That's hilarious. So, again, you, you, you get relationships and you have uh, discussions along the way to get back to you know, the point that you had brought up about you know, mm-hmm. how, how does this process work and what are you doing. And, uh, yeah, so it is, for me at least, I am I am rare, I guess. Um, I am anomaly. Uh, there are no other people that kind of do what I have done the way that I do it. And I don't say that with any measure of pride necessarily, so much as it is, I don't know, it's just the only way I know how to do it. Yeah. What's, is the, was the Monopoly the hardest one you put together, or what would you say the hardest licensing deal was? Well, I mean, that was a daunting task. Yeah. Absolutely, because the, there was nothing to work off of. And just trying to get them to embrace this notion of where, you know, where Leisure Time Entertainment was going and where there was a unique opportunity uh, to, to take advantage of some extended exposure in a way that maybe the brand hadn't enjoyed and wasn't enjoying. You know, something to further perpetuate the beauty and wonder and marvel and timelessness of Monopoly. Um, yeah. That was a hard one, but, you know. Well, <laughs> excuse me. Bless you. Uh, this, I guess sneezing on the truth is my mother. <laughs> and, um, the Terminator. A little, a little a religious sidebar there, but yeah. anyway. Um, huh. I think uh, all of them have their own unique challenges. Yeah. Uh, I've always believed that uh, the easiest deals are the deals that are yes. The ones that I really enjoy are the ones that say no. Uh, to begin with Mm. because it allows me a chance to turn that no into a yes and I have two guiding principles Uh, one is if the expectation of financials is not practical or realistic then um, then I can't fight that right if you want X amount of dollars and it really is X minus Y and that's the only practical yeah. way to do it. And X minus Y needs to be it. If you don't like a particular category, and I've done work in, in, in other fields other than just, you know, slot machines and coin operating and using games, but if if you have some if you have some resistance to wanting to be part of it well, then my attitude is that that resistance needs to be based on fact. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Can't be based on 
stigma or, you know, the wrong thinking. It has to be based on the principles of it being something that you are just diametrically opposed. So there may be somebody who doesn't want to who doesn't want to be part of gaming. We'll use that as an example. Well, for what reason? Well, because I think it, it only appeals to old people and you're taking their money. Oh, au contraire. <laughs> No, 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 no. Let's talk about let's talk about reality. Um, and the reality is X, Y, and Z. If you still then feel that you don't want to be involved with it, then I understand. You know, if you absolutely are against or opposed to you know pinball, okay, then that's the right reason. I can't, I can't change an ideology. All I can do is correct that ideology so that the reasons that you're saying it, that you don't want to go forward, are real. And there have been times that people have said absolutely no, under no circumstance, no, 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 and suddenly they come back and it's like, okay, is that opportunity still available? <laughs> Check, let me see. Because sometimes it's a confluence of timing. Yeah. You know, timing really needs to be there in any business dynamic. You know, sometimes you're too early, sometimes you're too late, sometimes you get it just right. Yeah, so you'll take a no if the, just the money to spare, they want way too much money and it's just not possible. Oh, I've turned down things, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I've even gone back into... And again, this is my perverse sense of loyalty. I've gone back into upper management saying, I would advise us not spending any more on this. Right. I wouldn't do it because I always tended to think of it as being my money, even though it wasn't. Right. Well, let's offer them X. <laughs> no, it's not worth it. Right. Offer them that. All right, fine. <laughs> Let me offer it. All right, we got a deal done. Whoopee. Great. Are we going to be in impairment? Can we earn it out? Yeah. They're really yeah. worth it. So, again, that's my level of uh, sensitivity. How was the Terminator one? Oh, that was great. Um, I flew out. We had a meeting set up uh, with Jim Cameron and Larry Kazanoff, director and producer. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Um, so, we were flying out to read the script and to meet with them to see if we even wanted to do it. The original conversation I had had with a fellow by the name of Danny Simon, who at that time was uh, working with uh, Carol Co., who was putting together Terminator, and Danny and I had had our paths cross some years earlier, which we didn't realize until we started talking. Um, we had talked about Total Recall. Yeah. a possible theme for a pinball machine. And the timing wasn't right. And he said, well, you know, Terminator is coming back. It's like, wow, really? I still remember, and, and when he talked about how long it had been, he was like, no, no, that can't be that long. I still remember the hand, the mechanical hand. Right, exactly. It's been that long? Wow. Okay, this is like 91. So we set it up when we were flying out. Uh, Steve Ritchie was going to be the designer on the pinball, and uh, George Petro was going to be one of the lead designers on the, uh, the video game if we were going to do them. And my comment to them, and I knew that a claim was going to be going out there as well because they were looking at locking in the home rights uh, for cartridges. Yeah. And uh, just told the guys, I'm kind of notorious uh, in terms of my, my dress and my style. We're sneakers a lot. Um, uh, not sneakers with a suit, but, you know, sport coat slacks. Tie, sneakers. sneakers, white sneakers. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's my look. Okay. Uh, but I told them, I said, uh, I want us going out, I want us wearing suits. And uh, I said, I'm going to bring real shoes. I, I, I do actually have real shoes. I'm bringing a suit, I want you to have suits. I had to go with Steve Ritchie. Steve didn't own a suit to get him to buy a suit for the trip. <laughs> because I wanted to go in being really serious. Right. And 
and uh, I remember names will remain nameless in, in terms of the acclaimed people who were a little bit more cash, if you will, for the meeting, and we were sitting in uh, the offices, and uh, we had uh, read the script and kind of knew what was going on, and at that time, in video games, uh, there was a breakthrough that Eugene Jarvis had kind of headed up, which was motion capture for a game called NARC. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with No, that. I'm not. I didn't see that. Uh, but uh, it was like the, the starting point for the Mortal Kombat's of the world and other games mm. that used real talent. And it was a man-run unit and, and all sorts of other things. And George had been on that team. And I wanted him to bring some footage to show the making of video games because we're not just doing little spritey things or whatever else. Uh, we're actually making, you know, video uh, the, the, the days of Pac-Man were if not over at least ending uh, in regard to what you could uh, actually create for, uh, for on screen so uh, Cameron walks in looks at us we introduce ourselves he said, and I just remember the first time <laughs> well we got bankers in here and it was exactly the response or reaction I wanted that is it was like, absolutely. Yeah. You know, we're serious about everything. And, and Steve talked about the design for Pinball and what goes on. And we had the uh, the presentation that George had brought. And I remember Jim turning his head and saying, you guys are doing movies just like we are. And it's like, yeah, exactly wow. right. That's amazing. And the same guys are just quiet. Yeah. Right. We're, we're not doing movies. <laughs> we're going to do a horizontal scrolling game <laughs> of some sort. <laughs> And, uh, you blew him away with your presentation and, and the Oh yeah, with that being said uh, It was like, well you guys got to get over to see Stan You know, we'll, we'll set that up for you guys to go over this afternoon To, to go to, uh, to Stan Winston uh, Because you're going to need access to stuff mm -hmm. And it was like, yeah, I, I need access to Arnold I need access to everybody, can we get that? And uh, we were able to achieve the kind of commitment that we needed, I think, because we came in really serious, just in our look, our approach. You know, we're, we're serious about making great games. Well, wow. that's and amazing. So it worked out really well, um, and uh, the games were incredibly successful, and uh, the rest, as they say, is history. And working with Arnold was, uh, was kind of cool, and we had games for the premiere, it's very strange, and I've done it a few times, uh, walking down the red carpet, and people are taking pictures, and it's like, I'm nobody. You know, don't take my picture. I'm not even a second or a third in any scene anywhere in that movie. <laughs> um, and, you know, you go into the theater, and, and then after the after party, and there you are standing with different celebrities by pinball machines for video games and trying to give them a little how-to. So do they end up playing them on the premieres okay. or something? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Oh, wow. Yep. So, it, again, it's, uh, I guess it's one of the byproducts, one of the perks, if you will. And I know that, uh, you know, Steve Rosen has experienced that as well at, at uh, various trade shows for slot machines, you know, where we have people there for ribbon cutting or what have you, and there they are, you know, buy the games for publicity reasons or just to play them. And so it's... Uh, How did you meet Steve? Um, we met when he actually came on board uh, WMS. I know that he was at Midway before. Uh, I don't think that our paths had crossed necessarily, although they might have. And uh, he was this uh, young, very intelligent uh, person. And I'm just this old fart, but uh, yeah, we kind of hit it off and played golf a few times together. Yeah. And uh, was there to uh, hopefully give some guidance and advice. Yeah on a number of different projects that uh, were license-based that he was overseeing as a producer. Yeah, because he obviously considers you a mentor of his. Well, and I'm appreciative yeah. of that. Uh, I'd like to think that whatever words of wisdom and guidance that I have given have been uh, beneficial. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think highly of Steve. Uh, I think he really is wonderful. He's great, yeah. And I think that, you know, depending on what he wants to do with his career ultimately, um, the sky's the limit. Yeah. Roger, this has been fantastic. I have uh, 
two more questions for you. I know we're. I'm like looking up. I'm getting wrapped up in your stories here. So, um, my apologies again. I told you paragraphs, and I'm just no. looking at the time and realizing I've kept you on. Far That's too okay. Long. Uh, do you have a few uh, time for a few more questions, or uh, you... I've, yeah, I kind of as I said, I blocked out time. Okay. Uh, I haven't heard the phone ringing off the hook. Thank God uh, for a Monday. God only knows how much email is piled up. <laughs> I don't want to think about that. But it's okay. Um, you know, since it's Inspired Insider, I always ask the lowest point and the proudest moment. What's been, would you say, the lowest point and then how you got through those tough times? Hmm. Um, I guess I'll do things that are close to home. The lowest point was losing my father when I was 14 hmm. and uh, needing to, you know, find a way on your own. Uh, highest point, the birth of my sons. Yeah. That's my legacy. My boys, I'm so proud of them. Forget about pinball, just proud of them and the values that they have and the men that they've become. So, I guess it's all, you know, family-based, if yeah. you will. That's but, the low, lowest you can get. Yeah, I mean, just the unexpected. My, my dad was very sick. Um, I saw him a few weeks before he passed away. Uh, he was in a hospital in New York. Mm. And uh, you don't know. I mean, uh, there was no warning or anything else. So uh, I think it tends to uh, shape people when they have those kind of life experiences. And it either drops you down or it lifts yeah. you up. Um, right. I think that, uh, you know, for me at least, in the way that I've lived my life, I guess it has always been something, and maybe it goes to the heart of you know, how I have been professionally. The no's I have to change to yeses. Right. The conceived notion as to who I am and what I'm about. You may not like me, <laughs> but you are only allowed not to like me for the right reasons. <laughs> 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 I mean, and I know that's you know nonsensical, but you know it, it's. My mother used to joke, yeah, if I say black, you say white. I said, well, there's gray in the middle, Mom, um, as long as the gray in the middle is right. Uh, so, so yeah, I think that it made me... Um, you think stronger. it toughened you up at the time? Oh, it's yeah, really I tough. Think it has to. I think yeah. when you lose a parent yeah. uh, that early in life, uh, that it absolutely shapes, shapes you yeah. in a way that maybe you wouldn't have been shaped before and I look I, I count my blessings that uh, the, the man that my mother found to, to marry uh, after my dad passed away was incredible it was yeah. wonderful I mean I, I, I used to dream about the fact I wouldn't have been great to have both of them simultaneously yeah um, yeah I mean I, I again I was blessed and, and again going back to you know what's the proudest moment um it's the uncertainty if you really have a desire to want to be a parent, and maybe some of that was driven by my my growing up um, and the way I grew up uh, in, in terms of losing my father, of uh, wanting to have a family, wanting to continue, you know, the lineage. Yeah. And uh, not knowing, I didn't know if I could. Didn't know if my wife could. Right. Being, being blessed with having uh, the birth of my sons. Oh, yeah. And being there? Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. I mean, work-wise, obviously, there's other things that come into play. What's been the proudest work business-wise for you? God. I don't know. There's been so many. Um, I think surviving and enduring early on. Well, talk about what's late. Yeah, what what are you working on lately? Well, well, I'll get to that in a second. Okay. Um, because I tend to think of it as being more self-serving. But I think that, you know, there was a point in time, uh, again, this, this somewhat, not a rude, but this somewhat naive person out of the Midwest working at NWR. Uh, the account that I was working on was AT&T um, and, and a couple of other accounts as part of the promotions and exhibits group. And uh, working on a project that I thought was just absolutely incredible and sitting in at a pitch meeting and, they didn't like it, and a fellow by the name of Dave Iden, because I went back to my office crushed, um, 
you know, I'm, I don't know, 21. Uh, I just, you know, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> Great, they don't see it, they don't recognize it, and Dave kind of took me aside, and it was something that was a difficult lesson to learn. And again, depending on the career path that somebody has, um, he said, look, you know, they don't know anything. Don't worry about it. It's not you. It's just they didn't like that idea. Right. And you have to be able to separate going yeah. forward. Whatever the idea is, whatever the output is, whatever you're thinking of creatively, that they're not attacking you personally. Right. And I was like, wow. Okay, I can do that. Mm-hmm. People uh, tend to uh, take so, things personally. You know, what, Right. So what yeah. am I doing now? Uh, well, Sharp Communications is a uh, creative services agency, and, you know, what we specialize in is everything from brand licensing to uh, advertising and marketing and promotion and PR and product design and development. All the things that I have touched, all the things that mm-hmm. I have worked on over my entire professional career touches all of those particular disciplines. So I have a range of clients and a number of different projects, and uh, I get to babysit them all, and as you suggested, go through that arduous process (laughs) of however long (laughs) it takes. Can I track down the right folder? God, they want such and such? Okay, how do I get to that guy? Right, how do you get get to these um, people? Or Flappy Bird as a license how do I track this thing down versus the ones that are easy? What's the oh. one that you thought was the toughest that you actually, like just tracking the person or whatever? Oh, one of the toughest, down. obviously, yeah. and, and admittedly, would have been uh, Willy Wonka. Uh-huh. It was trying to get the rights. It, it took me uh, about four years, maybe close to five, to yeah. pull yeah. that one together. Uh, you know, tracking down, uh, let's see, the studio produced the movie, they have, nope, all right, David Walper and Associates, all right, let me try to reach that. Wow. Talking to some assistant to say, hi, oh, no, 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 it has to go back to uh, Lizzie Dahl, Raul Dahl's widow. Okay, where oh is she? Oh, my God. Okay, all right, let me reach out to them. Let me do this, let me do that. I mean... This is what I want to hear. Yeah, I want to hear the nitty-gritty stuff. So it was, uh, you know, yeah. all of that uh, initial whole work, if you will, yeah. uh, just digging up the ground and trying to get some firm stances to, all right, where can I start planting my seeds? Where can I start to grow this so that maybe we can get it done? Yeah. And eventually Warner Brothers came on board with the project and uh, got to turn a, yet, a no into a yes. Um, and the net result, and I know that it is still a core brand for what is now known as scientific games. It's a core brand for them. I take a lot of pride in the fact that they never would have had it if I hadn't been there. And they never would have had it if I hadn't been willing to stay the course, to be persistent, to not yeah. give up, and to just, you know, hey, it's a new day. Look, there's far too many voicemails and emails of, like, I'm sorry to bother you again. Don't mean to be annoying. Don't mean to be persistent. But is there a decision yet? Where are we going? What's going on? And sometimes right. people are difficult to track down. Right. Uh, during the course of a year, there are any number of you know trade shows and business events and God only knows what, where the people who have said we'll talk next week, suddenly next week becomes next month. Right. Or yeah. next year at the trade show. Or Exactly. Or next year. I mean, I've been working on some projects for a current client that I began uh, back in June where I'm now reaching closure on the first couple. Right. Oh, that's what, eight months? Nine months? Right. That's insanity. But it isn't. It's something that I thrive on. And my only hope is that the clients that I work with have an understanding of uh, you know, the task at hand. I have also had situations, and this will remain nameless. Yeah four projects where everything up front is great and the final approvals are the pain. Mm. All the red tape and stuff. Oh, I've gone through two and three years of back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Jeez. uh, Oh, my God. And even to the point where I've had situations where it's like, God, we really have an interest in wanting to pursue this. And it's like, nope, nope, don't want to. 
Don't want to do it. It's going to be too difficult. Don't know what you're getting into. I prefer us not to do that. I've already worked with them on a couple of things. I'm just telling you ahead of time. Right. I'll save you seven years. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Truly. But again, I mean, that's it, it is the art of the deal. It is relationships. Yeah. Um, because that's really what it boils down to. Ultimately, it's a, it's, it's building that trust. Do they trust what you are saying? If I'm going into a category for the first time as a licensor or a licensee, okay? Yeah. Now, let's look at it because I've been on the other side of the fence as a licensor. Mortal Kombat, we had an incredible program. You know, feature movies and action figures and hats and T-shirts, you, you name it. Uh, but you don't want to feel like you are being uh, taken advantage of. Right. Roger, how do I know that this is the best deal? And that you're not trying to take advantage of me. You know, that's been asked a number of times. Right. What are you telling We've never done anything in this category before. How do I know that this is good? Or I've had other things where I'm not involved at all, but I have people from studios or sports leagues or whatever else, agents, reaching out to me for advice. Yeah. Roger, can't tell you who the partner is, but this is kind of what they're offering. What do you think? Yeah. Well, I think you can do better. Yeah. Yeah, this is what I would. Advise. People just don't know what's good for right. certain things, right? And and again, not being anyone who was complicit in any way, shape, or form. I was like, hey, they asked for some advice. It doesn't impact what it is that I'm working on, or any of my clients, uh, and and whether I have anything that is strictly and uh, significantly set in stone where it's a non-compete in a category, uh, yeah, let me give some advice. I know when we turned down, we being the company known then as WMS Gaming, it was like that. We did two pinball machines with Cassandra. Both were incredibly successful. She is game and open to do a slot machine. Yeah. Cool. Let's see what we can do. This is going to be great. And we turned it down as a company. They didn't want to do it. Really? Well, they were approached uh, by some others and asked my advice. You know, what do you think of these companies? And I was like, oh, these are pretty good. Okay. And then, you know, a few weeks later, a couple of months later, you wind up hearing from Mark and Cassandra. They made this offer. What do you think? No way in hell. This is what it should be. Mm. So you get close to the... Well, what happens if they say no? Look, all you're going to do is you're not demanding. You're asking. This is part of the negotiation. Right. If they say no because you're just asking a question as to, you know, would it be possible to get more or different or better, well, then how is it going to be when they're going to do creative? I mean, my right. own up front, I don't think that asking for anything different is terrible. Right. I mean, if I'm going to buy a house, uh, if I make a low ball offer, it doesn't necessarily mean when they say no that I'm out of it. Right. Maybe they'll come back and say, hi, I'll take $5,000 off. Ooh, right. God. now we're having some fun. <laughs> this is going into a department store where the merchandise is labeled and that dress is going to cost $490 or you go to the salesperson saying, you know what? My wife here really loves that dress. I'll give you 300 for it. I mean, this is not, you know, a foreign country where you wind the up... The worst thing is they say no. Haggling. Right. So, so, yes, I mean... I think that that becomes uh, a, a real dividing line uh, when it comes to trying to secure relationships. Has there been any kind of prior experience in the category or with this particular company on either side of the fence? And if there isn't, then you know that, you know, all right, let's put on you know, the high waiters and, and we're going to get through this. Yeah. So what kind of companies come to you now? Is it slot machine companies or what? I am working on behalf of a uh, slot machine company. I have worked in the, the online space with some uh, providers. Uh, many of my clients are coin-operated amusement game clients only because I've been around that for so long. Right. So whether it's video game companies, uh, pinball companies, developers, uh, people wanting representation. Um, you know, I'm still looking at doing some designing myself. And we'll see if that comes Really? Around. Oh, yeah. Um, I've had other companies outside the category and field who have come to 
my company for for marketing, uh, for PR, uh, for advertising. Um, so it's been uh, it's pr- pretty diverse in many ways, uh, which is great. Uh, I have uh, again, I am blessed and fortunate. I have an incredible network, and it's like hi, so and so suggested I contact you that maybe you can help us. Here's what we are launching for this exhibition, and we're looking for financial backers, benefactors. Are you interested? Yeah. Um, sure. Let me see what I can do. Or there have been times where, you know what? No, that's nothing that I can do, but why don't you contact these people, use my name, and let's see if they can help you. Yeah. And then I have also you know, business associates, uh, both here as well as abroad, that I work with uh, on, you know, particular endeavors. So that is sharp communications. Yeah. You have a lot on your plate. (laughs) I do, but, you know, I enjoy it. And, uh, you know, is there an overlap with some clients who are in the same category but working on different projects? Absolutely. But, again, I've built up enough trust where everybody knows that I'm not going to reveal anything from one client right to you keep it confidential between clients and you know, uh, I do and yeah. more importantly everybody also knows depending on category if somebody is desirous of a particular license ask me first because I've had situations where it's like Roger we're just thinking that we'd love to get why yeah you can come well I gotta tell you something yeah. you you know, right now terrain. I already have somebody wanting why hmm um, if they fall out, if things don't happen, I will absolutely come back to you. You're second in line. Yeah. You're third in line. You're fourth in line. And I don't want to feel like I'm a deli counter, but there have been occasions where that has been the case. That's a good position to be in, right? Uh, I think so. Yeah. You know, I've had a situation truly where somebody, uh, again, uh, one of my clients, who questioned because there was a brand that came out, from a competitor, I was like, I got this phone call. I was like, hey, what the heck's happening? I thought that we were going to get it if so-and-so wasn't going to get it. And I was like, well, if you look closely at it, the people who developed it that I did the license for are the ones that actually have a license. They went to a different manufacturer. So I wanted getting an apology. All right, you're right. You're right. I said, no, I never betray you. <laughs> so again, you know, sometimes there's a delicate balance yeah. of it, but... Uh, I'd like to think that over the years I've come up with, uh, you know, the, the correct approach yeah. to, uh, to thrive and survive yeah. on behalf of my clients. I mean, that's valuable just to kind of know the terrain. If someone wants a certain thing, you can kind of gauge from the relationships you had, this is a great company to work with or great, this, this will take X amount of time or, you know, if you've seen certain things over your, with your experience... That could come in very handy for a company, I would say. I, I think so, and, and truly, all I ask of a client that is desirous of a particular property is, uh, I want a business plan. Uh, give me what the financial parameters are. What you yeah. kind of market, What kind of rights do you need? Yeah, because it's your reputation, also. Right, and I want to know that you know what they are doing is something I believe in. There have been some times where somebody has wanted something that's like you know. I'm just not comfortable with, with, with doing this. Yeah. Or going back to the potential licensor and just saying, hi, um, I'm not going to do it because I, I just don't think the quality is going to be there. Um, I, don't, I don't think that the support is going to be there. So uh, if you wind up getting pitched by you know somebody else or whatever else, just be forewarned. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean... I, I want to be, and, and again, I, I don't think that it's, it's vanity or anything else. Uh, I, I, I want to believe in, in everything that I am going to be touching. Yeah. yeah. Roger, this has been absolutely fantastic. Where should we, lead, what should we, um, where should we point people towards? What, uh, where can they find you? What website? <laughs> I don't have a website for my company. Um, you know, Sharpcom One is uh, me and AOL. Yes, probably the only person still using AOL in the world, uh, as my sons point out. Um, yeah, I mean, 
I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm around. I'm available, potentially. I guess they could find you on LinkedIn if they want to say hello, connect I'm with sorry? you. Uh, LinkedIn, they could find you. and Yes, they can find me on LinkedIn. You. Thank you. Yes. Um, what uh, lesson should we leave people with? I mean, we talked about a lot of different things. I think these, these look the lessons. Yeah. There are life lessons in, in, in regard to, uh, you know, what you have done so well with uh, some of your other interviews, and I'm just this kind of blip off on the side with some very strange um, category, a product that has somewhat defined my life. Right. I, I think the only suggestion and advice that I would offer would just be true to, to oneself. Yeah. You have to find some satisfaction in your life. And I know that some people are totally focused in on, on the money. And I don't negate that. I think that that's great. But at the end of the day, when you kind of look back, have you accomplished and achieved what you always wanted to do? Within reality, look, you know, I'm beyond the point of running in the Olympics or being a professional baseball player or being a professional bowler. You know, those were great things. And if if the skill and talent level had been there at some point in time, I would have pursued it. But I think that sometimes we find ourselves hopefully doing things that give us satisfaction. At the end of the day. There's a level of enthusiasm and excitement. There's a sense of um, satisfaction that you've actually done something that day that was meaningful, even if it was a small step to multiple steps. Um, just take pride in the excellence of what you can achieve as a human being. I, I think that that really is, you know, my guiding principle. Yeah, I was talking. Well, I know it's old-fashioned. No, yeah. I know it probably doesn't work anymore. Uh, for people, but um, I, I think that, you know, you have to have a certain level of morality. Uh, you have to have a certain value set that defines who you are. I don't care if that means that you're not the best plumber in the world or the best electrician, but you're going to do the best that you can do on every job that is given to you. And, uh, you know, if there's something that's more meaningful in terms of being a doctor or a an attorney, uh, that you're going to take care of your patients and clients to the best of your ability and see it through so that uh, they deserve the kind of care uh, that they deserve. Yeah. I, yeah. I, think it, I think it transcends, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. If that's meaningful at all, without being too philosophical or sure. thinking as if I'm somehow pontificating, which mm -hmm. I'm not. No, yeah. not at all. No, I appreciate that. Steve, I was asking Steve, I'm like, what should I be asking Roger? What's some interesting things? And he says whenever you have a meeting, you'll lay candy on the table. <laughs> yes, well, I do. What's, about, what's that about? All right. So um, <laughs> I years ago, and, and less so now, fortunately, I, I used to go to many different trade shows. Yeah. in a variety of categories, and it goes back to my days at GQ, um, where I was covering a lot of different fields just out of curiosity. Right. Many of the subjects I was writing on, some of them I was assigning. But, you know, I was there at a point in time where, and, and this is not necessarily not wanting to be politically correct, but GQ, when I got there, was a gay trade magazine, basically. Right. And I was there at a point in time to really kind of change its course and turn it into a men's lifestyle magazine. So in doing that, kind of really looking at the front and back of the book, as well as the well, the middle, and coming up with features, subjects, and so on, from you know, uh, investing to grooming to travel to the type, types of audio systems you may want. And I know that that term is no longer used, so my apologies, or... <laughs> the type of car you want to drive. I mean, all of that right. became part and parcel. So I wanted to go into a lot of trade shows, and that kind of continued as my career kind of continued as well. And there was one occasion at one point in time where I was at a trade show, and you're walking floors for however many days, hours. It gets dry. I mean, if I'm at a consumer electronics show, as I used to do years and years ago, all of <laughs> all the moisture in the air is just sapped by all of the product that's on the floor, from TVs to, to so on. Right. Computers and all the rest of it. So I'd always have some candy in my shoulder bag. 
Um, because during the course of the day, you know, just a couple of little pieces of gummy bears or whatever else. I was in a meeting at, uh, again, one trade show, however many years ago. I'm at the end of a table, and, you know, the discussion is going on, and the person at the other end of the table is talking or whatever, and I very delicately, lightly reached down to the floor to my bag and, and went through to find some candy. And I got some candy. I thought that I had not made too much noise with the crinkling of plastic or whatever else. And I am going to put some candy <laughs> into my mouth unexpectedly from anybody else, not being anything. And I guess the person was talking. Just as I'm about to engulf about three or four gummy bears, I said, oh, did you bring enough for everybody else? And, you know, six or eight heads all turned to me as I am engulfing my gummy bears. And I said, oh, okay, sure. And I broke out, you know, some of the candy that I had, passed it around. Everybody loved what I had. It wasn't packaged. It wasn't like, you know, packaged stuff that you would find at a drugstore or whatever else. This was gourmet stuff. Right. And we can get into a whole discussion about that, but... It word kind of traveled. Again, small worlds that you wind up traveling in, depending on what your field of endeavor is, and suddenly it was Roger as a candy guy. Mm. So, yes, I do candy runs. I actually just did one. I'm going to be in New York next week for Toy Fair. And I did my candy run to uh, Woodfield Mall. I will do a plug for Get Happy. It's just across from Rainforest Cafe. Marvelous candy. Uh, in bins. Love it. And, uh, yeah, I did my candy How much run. do you have to actually buy for your meetings for this toy, uh, toy uh, project? Well, probably going to ask Steve on that, but uh, I spent uh, this last go-around uh, upwards of over $40 worth of candy. Okay. Nice. So I have multiple bags of things, different flavors, some sour, some sweet, some new things. I always try to bring something that's new. Yeah. I'll do a little bit of world market because some of it is already packaged. And wrapped. I know there are some people that uh, right. from years ago with SARS and everything else do not really appreciate my reaching into my bag, even though I may do it for myself and engulf. Right. Uh, would prefer not to have anybody touching anything. It's like, that's fine. Right. Up candy as well as freeloaded candy. So. Well, I had to ask that because he said that. I'm like, well, that sounds interesting. <laughs> yep. So that's that's how it all happened. Again, a selfish little thing. Done quietly, I thought, <clears throat> and having an entire table turn and say, okay, what do you got? Yeah. And then meeting, I do remember this, needing to go out somewhere because I had run out of candy. Well, wow. And needing to find a place, and I did, uh, find a place that had the kinds of candies that I wanted personally because everything is personal for me when it comes to my, my candy selection. So, yeah. It's got the mustache, the glasses. Sneakers and candy. That's me. Love it. You know, from thank you so much, Roger, from going from just wanting your own pinball game to what you've done is pretty <laughs> remarkable. So I really appreciate you taking the time. Well, it's my so. pleasure. I wish that the uh, the Skype stuff had worked longer no, for I, you. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm appreciative of you having the interest and desire to actually want to talk. And hopefully one of these days, although it won't be on a basketball court, we'll have a chance to actually get together in person. Maybe well. over a game of pinball. There you go. You're on. Thank you so much. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.